Good morning, church. Please join me as we go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this first day of the week and for giving us the heart health and wherewithal to come to this place and hear another portion of thy word proclaimed. For we realize, Father, that thy only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, is the bread of life, and herein is where we chose to live our lives. So thank you, Father, for being our God. Father, we ask thy continued blessing of all on our prayer list to include those mentioned this morning. Our list is long and concerning and need thy strong and healing hand to reach down and make it all right. Dear Heavenly Father, the coronavirus is still loose and running rampant throughout the world. Several of our own members have contracted this virus recently. Our prayers are that you, Father, will reach down and push this thing from among us and let us let life move on until the next coming of our Lord and Savior. And Father, in all fairness to you, many in this nation believe that you have already given us an answer to the pandemic, the vaccine. So, thank you. Now, dear Heavenly Father, as we prepare to enter into our hour of study, we ask you to bless our preacher, give him ready recall of the message he has prepared for us today. Forgive us of our sins as we repent and thank you for Jesus who paid the supreme price for us. It's in his holy and most precious name that we pray. Let's all say amen. Let's sing song number 981. That was 981. And oh, the Next, let's sing song number 279. That was 279. Thank you. 
Next, let's sing song number 959. 959, and during the song, we will prepare for communion. Doso. I'll be reading in the book of John, chapter 19, beginning in verse 16. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him, on either side one and Jesus in the midst. 
And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Let us now pray for the bread. Our Almighty Father in heaven, we come to you now thanking you for Jesus. We're thankful, Father, that he left heaven, came and lived upon this earth as a man, and did so sinlessly, and then willingly died upon the cross for our sins. He knew that it would be a cruel death, but he was willing to do that for us, that we might have our sins forgiven. We're thankful, Father, for his sacrifice. We're thankful for his body, which was given for us. And we're thankful for this unleavened bread, which represents that body. We pray that each of us might remember his death upon the cross as we partake of this bread. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let us now pray for the cup. Our Almighty Father in heaven, we again come to you thanking you for Jesus. We're thankful, Father, for his blood that was shed for our sins. We know that it is through his shed blood that we might have our sins forgiven. We know that Jesus was willing to drink the cup that was before him, and we're thankful to you for that. We're thankful for his blood that was shed, and we're also thankful for this unfermented fruit of the vine which represents that shed blood. We pray that you be with each of us as we partake of it. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's sing the first verse of 598. That was 598. Domiso, a common We now have the opportunity in our worship this morning to give as we are taught in the New Testament. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you now thanking you for everything that you give us. We're thankful, Father, that we live in the United States of America and the freedom that we have here. We're thankful, Father, for the places that we have to live, our clean water, our food, our clothing, our transportation, our access to health care, our security. All the many things that we have, Father, are from you, and we're thankful that we live here now in this time in history. We pray now that as we look to give back to you, we do so as we have already purposed in our hearts, that we each might give abundantly, and that we do so with the attitude of the things that we have aren't truly ours, but they're yours and that we're just stewards. We pray, Father, that as we give, we do so with the, the right attitude, and we pray that these funds are used wisely, that we can have an impact, not only in this area, but in the entire world. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.
As they're finishing the collection, if you would like to mark the song that will follow our lesson, that will be song number 466. That was 466. And the song that will be before our lesson will be song number 625. That was 625. And if it's not a burden to you, let's stand as we sing. Please be seated. Today's scripture reading is John fourteen twenty seven. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the word gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. As Jesus was preparing for his imminent arrest and trial and crucifixion, speaking to his disciples, he displayed an attitude of sober confidence. John 16, 32, he said to them, indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. Notice the confidence that Jesus had in the face of the trials that he would bow would soon experience. He knew that God would be with him. Similarly, he knew that there were troubling days ahead of the disciples, and so he wanted to give them peace and comfort. He wanted to encourage them to know that they too could overcome fear, and so through faith could overcome the world. As was just read for us from John 14, 27, Jesus said that he gave his peace to them, and so they were not to let their hearts be fearful. John 16, Jesus would say, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now we were just led in the song, let the beauty of Jesus be seen in you. Here is the idea of the beauty of Jesus with regard to the fears 
that we face in life. Jesus had confidence in God such that he could overcome the fear that he faced in his life. And it was his desire for his disciples then and for us today that we through faith in him may also have peace and may have victory over the fear that we face in this world. Remember we have learned that faith is the victory. 1 John 5, verse 4, beginning, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. We can, through faith in Jesus Christ, have victory over the world, and in saying that we can have victory over the world, we mean that we can have victory over the various temptations that we face in the world, over the various sins that we face in the world, 1 John 2, 15 through 17. We can have victory over anything that might hinder us in our relationship with God. Last Sunday morning, we saw that we can have victory over sins with which we struggle in our lives. We can overcome their guilt and we can overcome their power through faith in Jesus Christ. This morning, we want to consider that we can, through faith in Jesus Christ, have victory over the fear that we face in life. Now, we know it's the case that in life we will experience fear. We all experience fear. It's a part of our human nature. It's a part of our human condition in this world. We might say that it's a natural part of life. Some of our fears are reasonable. They are rational. Others of our fears are not rational are reasonable. We are going to learn in our study this morning as we consider fear that some of our fears might be, for all intents and purposes, harmless. That is, they they might not have a real impact on our relationship with God, though they may rob from us a certain amount of peace that we could otherwise have in our lives. We're also going to see that there are some fears that we have in this life which are a hindrance to our faithful service to God. Fears which are a hindrance to our right relationship with God. And so what we want to learn in our study together this morning is that there is a proper way to look at fear. In fact, we're going to see in our first point that there is a good kind of fear that we should experience in our lives and have in our hearts that will produce very good things for us in our relationship with God. And then there's a bad kind of fear. We need to know what it is, understand it enough that we can see how it affects our relationship with God. And then in our second point, we want to understand how faith in Jesus Christ can help us overcome that kind of fear so that it does not hinder our faithful relationship with God. So this morning, a message of encouragement from Scripture, faith is the victory over the world and faith is the victory over the fear that we sometimes face in our lives. Consider with me first that as we look at this subject of fear in light of Scripture, we see that there is a good kind of fear and a bad kind of fear. Now, I feel strange saying to you that there could be a good kind of fear, but I think as we look at Scripture, we'll see what we could mean when we say that there is a good kind of fear, and I'm sure we all agree and understand that there's a bad kind of fear. Perhaps a definition will help us see how there could be a difference, a good kind of fear and a bad kind of fear. The American Heritage Dictionary says first that fear is a feeling of agitation and anxiety caused by the presence or imminence of danger. And so probably when we think of fear, this is the first kind of fear that we think of, that anxiety or agitation we feel in the presence of imminent danger. But then there's a second kind of fear, or at least a second definition of fear, and that is an extreme reverence or awe as toward a supreme power, an extreme reverence or awe as toward God. So when we say then that there's a good kind of fear, one which produces benefits in our lives, I imagine you know right away which fear that is, right? That is the fear which is an extreme awe or reverence toward God. So consider with me that good kind of fear, that extreme reverence or awe as toward a supreme power power. Now here is a kind of fear that we would feel in our hearts and in our minds as we think about God if we are thinking about God correctly and if we are thinking about ourselves correctly. Imagine for a moment if you, moment if you were in the presence of God himself like Isaiah in the throne room of God. What do you suppose you would feel? 
Don't you think that you would probably feel some fear? That we probably would experience this extreme reverence or awe toward this supreme power God? Well, the truth is that it's good for us to have that kind of proper respect for the power of God and for his role in relationship to us and our lives. So notice all the benefits that come from the fear of the Lord as described in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 8.13, the fear of the Lord will cause one to hate evil. Proverbs 10.27, the fear of the Lord will prolong life. Proverbs 14, 26 and 27, the fear of the Lord provides strong confidence and is a fountain of life. Proverbs 16, 16, the fear of the Lord prompts one to depart from evil. That's right, isn't it? If I fear God, I don't want to do evil and meet him in judgment, do I? Proverbs 19, 23, the fear of the Lord leads to living a satisfying life and one in which one is spared much evil. Proverbs 22, verse 4, the fear of the Lord is the way to riches and honor in life. Now, when we look at the fear of the Lord, this idea of an extreme reverence are all before God, we could say this is a good fear isn't it because it produces these great benefits in our lives we could even say this is a reasonable or rational fear it's wise for us to feel this kind of fear and to allow it to have its effect on our hearts and on our choices in our lives consider the words of Jesus Matthew 10 28 do not fear those who are able to kill the body but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Notice that Jesus says, here's a rational fear. The rational fear is to fear God. Don't fear man, but do fear God because of the power that God has, the power to judge us, the power to judge our souls. We're told to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, Philippians 2 verse 12. Well, what role does this fear play with regard to our salvation. If I fear God as I should, then I would want to be in a right relationship with God. I would want to be saved from my sin so that when I meet God on that day of judgment, I will meet him prepared to hear that well done, thou good and faithful servant. So first there is this good fear. Now Meister Eckhart, a theologian of the 13th century, said the right fear is the fear of losing God. The fear of God is a right fear to have in our lives. Oswald Chambers draws out the importance of this fear, particularly in relation to the bad kinds of fear that we experience, the the kinds of fear that rob us of our peace and that would hinder our relationship with God. He says this, The remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. So here is a good fear to have in our lives. When we fear God, we don't have to fear anything else. That's the message of faith as the victory over fear. So let's have this good fear, the fear of God in our hearts and in our lives. But what about that bad fear? We said there's a kind of fear, which is an agitation or anxiety that's caused by what we sense to be an imminent danger. Well, certainly there are these kinds of fears that we experience in our lives, and we might ask, why are these fears bad fears? Now, with regard to our physical safety, there's a time when feeling a fear like this is a good thing, isn't it? Because it will prompt us to protect ourselves, to preserve our lives, perhaps to fight for our lives or to flee or to run away for our lives. But oftentimes, we feel these kinds of fears Uh, with regard to dangers which are not real. That is, we believe there are dangers there, but in fact, there aren't dangers. Maybe we would say we feel anxiety, or we find ourselves worrying about things that are beyond our control, things that very likely will never come to pass, but which in the meantime will rob us of our peace. God doesn't want us to have that kind of fear. He wants us to overcome that kind of fear, not to be anxious for anything, Philippians 4, 6, but rather through prayer and supplication to make our requests known to God and to thus experience the ruling of the peace of God in our hearts and in our lives. Now, we might say of these kinds of fears that they aren't necessarily sinful in that sense. They may not hinder our relationship with God, but they certainly could hinder our full joy and happiness our peace in Christ 
in this life. Now, you could probably make a list of the kinds of fears that fit into this category, and uh, I'm going to name here for you a, a dozen or so of these kinds of fears. You probably experienced some of these. There is the fear of speaking before a group. Maybe you've experienced that. The fear of heights, the fear of insects and bugs. I one time saw one of the strongest people I've ever known in this life run across a house because a spider crawled out from under the couch onto the living room floor. We understand this kind of fear, don't we? Okay, the fear of deep water, financial problems, the fear of disease, the fear of flying, of loneliness, fear of dogs, fear of riding in a car, driving, the fear of the dark. I like to rephrase that as the fear of the thing that's in the dark, right? Uh, and then the fear of death. We probably all experience these fears in one degree or another in our lives, or we have. Maybe we've struggled with how they've hindered us. Maybe we've recognized that we need to overcome them in our lives. I'm speaking to you from experience. I trust you can share with me in that experience. And I believe the word from Scripture with regard to faith and the victory of these fears is that we can overcome them if we want to. We can, through Christ, find the kind of strength that allows us to face these fears and nevertheless to have peace in our lives. It's not necessary that we be robbed of peace in our lives because of these kinds of fears. It has been said that fears make problems seem greater than they really are. There's a German proverb that says fear makes the wolf bigger than he is. Fear makes the wolf bigger than he is. And so the word from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is that we should take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, Matthew 6, 34. What was Jesus' meaning in that word of exhortation? It was that whatever comes tomorrow, we can face it then. And with God's help and through faith, we can overcome it. And so we shouldn't allow the challenge that we might face tomorrow, the danger that we might face tomorrow to rob us from the joy that we could have in our lives right now. When we think about these kinds of fears, we recognize that they have the potential to rob us of joy and that that's a serious matter, that Jesus wants us to live in joy in Christ right now and that, in fact, that's a part of our influence before the world, that we want to influence the world by saying, you know, I can overcome that fear through Christ and I would love to help you do that as well. Jesus said, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All of these things shall be added unto you. We worry about what will happen tomorrow with regard to the provisions for which uh, we have need in this life. And Jesus' answer is, seek first the kingdom of God and you'll be able to face that. So first, with regard to this bad kind of fear, which causes us anxiety, which robs us of joy, which may cause us to fear tomorrow, and which may impact our influence before the world, we can overcome that fear. We should, through Christ and faith in him, be able to find peace in our hearts and in our lives. But then consider that there are some kinds of fears that might lead us to disobey God. And that's very serious, isn't it? When we experience a kind of fear that would lead us to disobey God. One survey of young people, high school, college age people, asking them the question, what are the things that you fear in your life? Here were four of the top fears that they reported. They feared failing in school, 44% responded. They feared loneliness, 33% responded. They feared not having a boyfriend or a girlfriend, 30%. They feared social rejection, 28%. Boy, we can relate to those fears, can't we? Those of us who've lived through those times, we look back and we say, we can relate to that. I worried about making uh, poor grades. I worried about not fitting in. I worried about being alone, not having a boyfriend or a girlfriend. We experienced those things. Uh, but when we look back on that, we also probably remember that those fears could lead us to make some bad choices, couldn't they? The fear of failure in school might lead a person in high school or college to do what? Cheat. Okay. And so here is a fear, and it's led me to commit a sin. The fear of being lonely or of being rejected socially might make me want to fit in so much that I do things I know I shouldn't do as a Christian. Maybe I go to that party I shouldn't go to. Maybe I drink at that party or I smoke that thing that's passed to me. Or maybe I dress in some way that I shouldn't. I speak in some way that I shouldn't because I want to fit in. I'm afraid of not fitting in. Maybe a young person wants to have a boyfriend so much that they're willing to 
uh, participate in improper sexual activity because they want that boyfriend, because they're afraid of not having that important person in their life, of not feeling that way. The, the point being, of course, that we feel these fears, they're often very natural and normal, and yet if we don't handle them the right way, if we don't overcome them through faith, we will find that they've led us into sins in our lives. Now, the good news, of course, is that all of that stops with college, right? No, it doesn't stop. And me and I were having a wonderful conversation yesterday. We were talking about life and uh, a big decision that she's looking at. I hope she doesn't mind my mentioning. She's, you know, she's coming to that age, graduating from high school, looking at decisions. And, and so we were talking about that big decision. She said, you know, it's stressful. She said, this thing about approaching adulthood is hard. And I said, you know, I'd love to tell you it gets easier, but it just keeps going. It just happens to be this is the first time that you're encountering that. We just keep having to face those hard decisions, don't we? having to make those judgments, and, and we realize consequences will come from these, and we feel fear. So as adults, we could probably relate to these kinds of fears. We could recognize that, you know, if I fear that I might lose my job, I might cheat on my job. I might lie to my boss. If I uh, fear that I will be alone, I might decide to enter into a relationship of fornication with someone who expects that from me so that we can have a relationship together. Fear leads us to commit sin. So similarly, as Christians, we will face fears related to our Christianity. Might be ridiculed if I talk about what I believe. Might be mocked if I affirm that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he rose from the grave on the third day. We might face persecution for our faith. We might be uh, pressured not to practice our faith in the way that the Bible teaches that we should. What do we do in the face of those fears? We overcome them by faith. Remember the example of Christians in the first century. I think often of the words of Peter and John before the Sanhedrin, we ought to obey God rather than men, Acts 5, 29. Where did they ever learn such a strong and confident faith? They learned it from Jesus Christ, didn't they? So we can, with faith, overcome these fears in our lives. And what we want to ask now is, how do we do that? It's important for us to realize that just as much as the Bible is a manual of instruction with regard to what is true, it is also a manual of instruction with regard to why we should want to do what it says do, and also how we do it. How is it that we live a life of courage and faith? How is it that we live a life of peace in which we overcome fear, and we overcome temptation. Well, we need to take a hard look at what fear might say about our hearts and what fear might say about our lives. You know, there is a relationship between faith and fear, isn't there? That's the whole point of our lesson, that with greater faith we can overcome fear. Of course, the, the converse of that, with greater fear, we probably have a problem with faith, don't we? Many texts in Scripture that suggest that where there is great fear, there is not enough faith. Great fear indicates small faith. We're going to look at three passages together here quickly. If you will, please turn to them with me. Matthew chapter 8, let's begin at verse 23. Matthew chapter 8, beginning at verse 23. I want to notice here how Jesus associates faith with fear. When he sees fear in the disciples, he will direct their attention to their faith. What's wrong with your faith that you're feeling this kind of fear? Now, of course, in that he was speaking in love and compassion. He was wanting them to see that they needed to grow in faith and that if they would grow in faith, then they would have tremendous power and courage to overcome these fears, which certainly would come in their lives. Matthew 8, verse 23, beginning as uh, the disciples faced the storm on the sea. When he got into the boat, his disciples followed him, and behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being covered with the waves. But Jesus himself was asleep, and they came to him and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. He said to them, Why are you afraid, you men of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. The men were amazed and said, What kind of man is this? that even the winds and the sea obey him. Notice that Jesus, in the face of their fears, directed their attention to their faith. Let's look at Matthew 14, 25 through 33. Matthew 14, 25 through 33.
All right, beginning in verse 25, and in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, you have little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped and those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, you are certainly God's son. Notice the statement to Peter, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Peter needed to have a greater faith so that he could overcome this fear. Okay, let's look at Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 27. Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 27. Luke 12, beginning in verse 27, Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, but I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you? You men of little faith, and do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink, and do not keep worrying. For all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek, but your Father knows that you need these things. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Notice the words of Jesus, do not be afraid, rather have faith. Now we failed to mention this verse in our last point. You probably saw it on the screen, 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. There Paul was writing to the young preacher Timothy, and what do you think the young preacher was dealing with? He was dealing with fear. Now in the previous epistle, Paul had said to Timothy, let no man despise your youth, 1 Timothy 4.12. Very likely, Timothy was being despised by those to whom he was preaching because he was a young preacher. And so through fear was being hindered in his service to God as a preacher. So what was the inspired word from Paul to Timothy? The, the word was uh, that God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so what was true for Timothy then is true for us today as disciples of Christ, as we seek to serve him faithfully in our relationship to God. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, and yet we very often struggle with that spirit of fear, don't we? Well, one man said that fear is simply unbelief parading in disguise. As we feel that fear in our hearts and our lives, especially if that fear overcomes us, then we may need to take a long, hard look at our faith. Is our faith placed where it should be? Is our faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? That's where John says it has to be in order for it to be the kind of faith that will give us the victory, 1 John 5, verse 5. And then we may need to allow Scripture to talk back to some of those fears. Have you ever learned this coping mechanism that if you feel a fear, you talk back to the fear? You tell yourself the reasons why you shouldn't be afraid of that thing of which in the moment you're feeling afraid. And very probably if you've used that method, you've found just how effective it is that you can coach yourself by talking back to that fear such that you can overcome it and do the things that you just felt like you couldn't possibly do. Well, from Scripture, there's much that we could say in talking back to our fears. In fact, what's interesting is when we look into scripture, it is clear that God has anticipated the fears that we would feel and he has given us ways to talk back to those fears. In fact, we might say that God has done what we sometimes call a pre-mortem. Are you familiar with a pre-mortem? You know what a post-mortem is, right? Uh, after someone has died, they will go back and do a post-mortem and find out what was the cause of death, what went wrong here. I have a friend who was coached in sales in the business world to overcome fear by doing a pre-mortem. Pre-mortem was, you know, what are the things that I might face that might cause this to fail? All right, let's go ahead and look at those beforehand so that should one of them come up, I'm ready for it, and I know why I can overcome it, I know my strategy for overcoming it, I know what the answer is that I'm going to give to that fear 
so that I can overcome it. I'm going to do a pre-mortem. I'm going to consider the worst case. And I'm going to say, even if that very worst thing comes up, here's the answer for that. Well, from Scripture, we have an even if. The very worst thing comes up, we have an answer for it. The fact is that Jesus addresses our worst fears, and if we were to give his single answer for all of those fears that we might experience in our lives, the single answer would be that Jesus is always with us. Doesn't matter what we might face, what might come up today or tomorrow, and I know there's some very serious things that come up. We know that. We've experienced it. We're praying about some of those things right now. But whatever it is, we can face it, and we through faith can overcome it because Jesus is always with us. Matthew 28, verse 20, the fear of what we might face in life, Jesus' answer is, I am with you always, even to the end of the age or to the end of the world. Well, what's going to come up tomorrow? I don't know, but I know who will be there with me. Jesus Christ will be with me as I face whatever it is. Now, what does that allow me to say? It allows me to say that I will not fear and I will not be dismayed. I will be of strong courage just as Joshua was going into the promised land, Joshua 1 verse 9. It allows me to say, as the Hebrews penman said, the Lord is helper, my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Well, what could man do to me in this life that I cannot endure, that I cannot overcome because Jesus Christ is with me? Well, what about the fear of death? We all experience the fear of death, don't we? Sometimes uh, in worse ways than others, maybe because of things we see, things we experience, people that suffer, lives we lose. And so we feel that fear and there's an answer for it. Hebrews 2 verse 14 beginning, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also took part of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might free those who through the fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Notice many are subject to the slavery of the fear of death all of their lives, but through Christ we can be freed from that fear. Why? Because Jesus overcame the power of death and of the devil. And so through that, he offers to us the promise that we as well can overcome death in the resurrection through Christ. Because of that, we don't have to fear what lies beyond this life. Paul said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain, Philippians 1, 21. Jesus said, do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. John 14, 1 through 3. We don't have to worry about what lies beyond this life, and we don't have to worry about how this life might end. Paul said, I'm now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them who love his appearing. We can, through faith in Jesus Christ, have victory over fear. We can be certain that we are going to face fear in our lives, but we don't have to be overcome by it. We don't have to live in a spirit of fear. We don't have to give up the peace and joy that we should have in our lives through Jesus Christ. We can have victory over fear through faith. We can live courageously and joyously and peacefully in Jesus Christ. And those of us who wear the name Christian are striving to do that. We'd love to encourage anyone today who is ready to live that life to make that decision. If you haven't begun living the life of the Christian, the life of courage and of joy and peace, we'd love to help you do that this morning. If you'll come in faith and penitence, confessing the name of Christ, we'll be happy to immerse you in water for the remission of sins. It may be that you've done that. Perhaps you've been overcome by fear and so have fallen into sin. We'd love to pray with you so that God could forgive you, so that you could live your life courageously and joyfully in Christ. If you have a need, if there's a way that we could pray for you, please make it known right now as we stand and as we sing.
Please be seated. Our final song this morning will be song 571. That was 571, after which we'll be led in prayer. I pray that every heart has taken something from this message this morning, uh, something that they can apply to their everyday lives, uh, where they can grow in grace and grow closer to you. Father, we thank you for the preacher and his work. May you continue to bless him with the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of your word. Uh, continue to give him the strength uh, to continue uh, preaching and being faithful uh, for holding true to form. And I pray that we all, Father God, as your children would hold true to form that which you have called us to be. Father, continue to pray for the shepherds of this congregation if you will continue to guide them and bless them through your word as they watch over the flock. I pray for the deacons, Father, that you continue to bless them in their service uh, that they will be faithful to you and guide them in the way of your word also. Father, I pray for those who may be having issues with their health or their spirituality, for any challenges we may have faced this week. Uh, we know that the devil may be mighty, but you are almighty. 
And we pray that you, uh, we do not allow the things of this world to tear us away from you or to cause us to do anything that would be contrary to sound doctrine. Uh, Father, uh, thank you uh, for helping those who have health problems and spirituality because you are the God of all comfort and you have comforted us with your son. I pray that we will embrace those things and continue to live by them. Uh, whatever, thank you for the great blessings that we've had this week and whatever challenges we've had, Father, help us to get past them and not allow them to control us or cause us to be hindered in our walk with you. Father, as we leave here this morning, protect us that we are not harmed in any way, uh, physically or mentally or spiritually. Uh, that we will stay close to you and that we will trust you and that our faith will be in you. And I pray that you'll strengthen that faith, that we will take hold to eternal life. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Uh, this is our prayer in Jesus' name, the sweetest name on mortal tongue. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.